Neon Genesis Evangelion. Three absolutely bizarre words strung together as the title of one of the world's strangest animated series. The show debuted its finale today, 27 years ago, and we're still discussing it now as much as ever. And it's not hard to see why. With religious iconography and clever utilization of science fiction tropes all used to analyze deep psychological and emotional states of the human condition, the show has carved its place into pop culture history as one of the most provocative and widely interpretive works of sci-fi since its inception. Unabashedly strange, emotionally translucent, and undeniably epic, it's the kind of show that sticks with you, reruns in your head, leaves you with two answers and a question like all great stories do. And as much as I wanted to rewatch the series the moment I finished it, life got in the way, and I found myself without the time or ability to do so. To last month. They say you never know a story until you know it twice. Something about the safety of the destination gives you a chance to explore the journey, and where my first viewing had been a blissed out, admittedly confused trip down an artistically ambitious road, my second viewing sparked nothing less than obsession. Long shots I'd thought boring became the highlight of the show, genre identity forced me to think real hard, and I will never see the color red the same way again. But what can you really say about this show that hasn't already been noticed? From 90s internet forums to early thousands blogs to YouTube essays distributed all throughout the tens, the show has been dissected to death, its premises and plot viewed through every lens and pontificated on from every school of thought. And yet, to my eyes, one aspect of the series has remained almost completely untouched by discussion. Now, I'm not here to rehash the show's overambitious emotionality, the psychoanalytical postulations it plays with, or the theological material it blatantly displays. I'm pretty sure more men than I could credit have already tried, and I'm not looking to join the masses. Because even after hours of digging through articles, and blogs, and video essays, and even archives, I can't find anyone who's mentioned how this show was put together. I'm not talking about the story behind the story. It's well known how showrunner Hideaki Anno suffered from clinical depression during production, and how his views and interests shaped the series overall. But everyone's obsessed with the art or the artist, and they're ignoring the presentation of the present. With Evangelion, the topic of discussion tends to revolve around the psychological and emotional impact of the series, and rightfully so. But after re-watching the show more than I care to admit, I couldn't help but notice that everyone focuses on the story, not the anime. The composition, framing, lighting, use of music, use of color, visual motifs, screen direction, messages lost in translation. Not everything about this show's delivery goes unnoticed, but the bulk of it goes unmentioned. So I guess I gotta speak up. The edit is as old as the camera. Since the first moving picture was captured on celluloid, people have spun it in reverse, flipped it around, cut it shorter, and dabbed paint across the film. If to film is to think, then to edit is to say. And much like the language we all use to function, film editing has evolved and morphed over the years to streamline the communication of information and convey new ideas. A movie of any length or nature is made principally of two components the shot, and the order of the shot, or shots. As films matured, and more shots could be captured and messed with, people began experimenting more with their order and presentation. The cameraman could adjust the lighting, the angle, composition, aperture, even the frame rate, but the editor took charge from there. And if the shot was a word, the edit was a sentence, and it did not take long for people to say some wild things. Like all languages, film adapted out of necessity to preserve clarity. Nowadays, with over a hundred years of trial and error, we as an audience have a fundamental understanding of how film language works. How to read it, if you will. We know films are shown horizontally, usually 16 by 9. A close-up denotes intimacy, a mid-shot conveys presence, and a wide shot intends spectacle. Filming a conversation? Shot, reverse shot. Want to show off? Shoot a one -er. These and thousands of other techniques have become conventional in film, some specific to individual genres, with only a few projects brilliant and daring enough to break a rule and get away with it. But Neon Genesis Evangelion doesn't break a rule. It breaks all of them. Alright, let's back up. How do we know when a rule has been broken in filmmaking? Simple. The same way you know you made a bad joke. Context clues. 
Remember when I said editing techniques have become conventional for specific genres? That goes for media of all forms. If an audience is on edge while reading your rom-com, you probably gotta work on your grammar, and nobody puts jump scares in a musical. Otherwise, you fall into a sort of narrative dissonance, which is a fancy way of saying you're giving off mixed signals. So what is Evangelion, technically speaking? And what signals should we be receiving from it, and what rules, if any, does it break? Well, let's start with a good old definition. Neon Genesis Evangelion is a Japanese animated series released in October of 1995. It follows a group of characters, Shinji Ikari chief among them, as they use giant robots to wrestle with supernatural angels while trying to overcome their greater flaws. A quick Google search reveals Evangelion to be of the action drama genre, and honestly I think it's hilarious we're still using labels as basic as these for media. Wikipedia goes a bit further, associating such genres as apocalyptic, mecha, and psychological drama, and bingo, we're getting closer. Hypertechnically, Evangelion, like most stories, has two genre distinctions, which we'll call setting and nature. Evangelion's setting falls into the post-dystopian mythic science fiction genre. I know, I know, let's break that down. Dystopia is a popular genre setting denoted by a society on the brink of ruin, usually in decline due to environmental factors or authoritarian overextension. In Evangelion's world, it's both. An apocalypse has already occurred, and a major point of conflict is the government preventing the angels from triggering another one. This is done using mechas, giant human-shaped robots built for combat, and thus the show adopts an element of mythic science fiction, my personal favorite genre, which is to say, it's fantasy disguised as sci-fi. Now, what I mean by a genre's nature is simply genre in a more traditional sense of the word. The intertextual patterns within social dynamics known to elicit specific emotional responses. The genre nature of the film Kate and Leopold is that of romantic comedy, while Titanic is melodrama and Inception is a psychological thriller. For the majority of its run, Neon Genesis Evangelion is all three. Mainly psychological melodrama, with elements of romance and comedy sprinkled throughout, not to mention a good dose of fantasy action whenever the Avas come out to play. As the series progresses, though, we see these genres begin to break down. That is, we see the conventional elements of these categories being contradicted, subverted, and outright missing from interactions and happenings down the line. This has earned Evangelion a reputation of genre deconstructionism, making it a work of metagenre, a series aware of its identity. This is the first of many rules it breaks. Most stories, films especially, are graded both on the execution of their individual premises and their adherence to the conventions of their genre's nature. Action films are judged on their vivacity, comedies on their hilarity, and romances on their… well, r romanticness. Of course, that makes a work of metagenre like Evangelion notoriously difficult to analyze or critique in this way, which is why so many commentators have taken a stab at it with wildly differing takeaways. On top of genre difficulties, you also have to consider medium. Medium is the form which artwork or storytelling is shown in. For film, this is usually live action, two or three dimensional animation, or spliced visuals. More than this, you have arguably the most important aspect of any form of storytelling, receptive presentation. People go to the movie theater to experience films in their optimal presentative condition. In gaming, there's a big difference between a flat screen and a phone, and even the same book with altered font and kerning reads differently. Evangelion is an animated television show. That seems really basic to say considering what we've already covered, but there's actually a lot to unpack here. Evangelion was produced by Studio Gainax, hand-drawn in traditional two-dimensional cell-styled animation. During its original presentation, Evangelion was released on an episodic basis, with 23 minutes of content airing on public television once a week for 26 consecutive weeks. Great, so now that we know what Evangelion is technically, let's take a look at what it does narratively. Shinji Ikari is our central emotional tether and audience surrogate. We get thrown into high-pressure situations with him while everyone else in the show is already clued in to some degree about the happenings surrounding him. We're on his path of discovery, and the only time we deviate from his perspective is to reveal plot information to heighten the viewer experience, or delve into the personal emotions of other characters that are complicating their relationship with him. Everything is about Shinji and his struggles, and the local world reflects that. Now I gotta explain local worlds. So there are two kinds of worlds a story takes place in, local and non-local. 
A non-local world exists regardless of the characters and their struggles. The Marvel Cinematic Universe takes place in a non-local world. It's plot-driven. If you subtract any major character, life goes on uninterrupted, other characters living out their personal stories. A local world, on the other hand, exists only for the characters within it. It's a stage set for them. Without those characters, there's no reason for the world to exist. Most stories take place in local worlds, and you may not even realize it. Signs. Remember Signs? The alien invasion occurs solely so that our characters use it as a foil to solve their emotional problems. Not a half-bad film when you see it that way. Evangelion also inhabits a local world. The history of supporting characters and organizations exists solely for Shinji, Asuka, Rei, and Misato to reach a moment of emotional climax where they might overcome their flaws. Every character's past has been meticulously constructed to pit them in a place of optimal emotional struggle. The angels themselves, the central protagonists of the series, all represent a personal struggle the characters are attempting to overcome at the moment, whether that's fear, vulnerability, misunderstanding, or the other numerous obstacles between them and peace. Realize this, not once does somebody get in an Ava to fight for humanity. They are fighting angels to kill their demons. Even the name Angels hints at this local purpose. Anyone who's watched their fair share of anime can tell you spirits in Japanese media, called yokai, are almost always translated into the English word demon or devil, even if their nature is benevolent. Evangelion distances itself from this stereotyping by specifically using the word angel, even making a point of it in the show when Shinji himself questions why the attackers have names of divine messengers. The word angel notably originates from Abrahamic religions, where angelic encounters typically force change by struggle. They prompt maturity by way of pain. Not a one-to-one -one comparison to angelic behavior throughout the show, but the intent of the title is important to keep in mind, especially as the series progresses. So to sum up, Neon Genesis Evangelion is a Japanese animated television series featuring a local post-dystopian mythic science fiction world with narrative elements of psychological melodrama, fantasy action, and romantic comedy. Got it? Got it. Alright. Now then, most people like to break Neon Genesis Evangelion's 26 episode run into four arcs, distinct in their direction, focus, and escalation of the narrative, but I personally found the series actually breaks down pretty cleanly into a five act structure. Episodes 1 through 4 detail Shinji's decision to involve himself, him finding his place. 5 through 10 outline the major relationships of the series, namely with Rei, Misato, and Asuka. Episode 11 to 15 mark the first evolutions of these relationships, and episode 16 is where the mold begins to break. With 16 through 20 deconstructing the individual relationships between characters, and 21 through 26, our final controversial stretch, ending in the conclusion of the plot and the deconstruction and re-establishment of the individual. Even the episodic structure is unique and intentional. Nearly every episode has two titles, the first, in Japanese, shown after an episode's introductory scene, and the second, in English, shown after the midway break. Both titles were chosen purposefully by Studio Gainax, and you'll realize that while the first establishes an episode's central premise, the second tends to operate as an update on that premise's exploration. By the time we reach the final act of the series, the structure begins breaking down. Next episode previews are no longer finished shots, but undeveloped animatics. Two episodes skip the opening sequence altogether, and the final chapter in our story deteriorates into live-action photography and swaths of bold lettering aimed at our characters from no known direction. Animation as a medium undergoes deconstruction. Complex structures reduced to basic lines, and Shinji speculating on his innate identity in relation to the symbols used to represent him. Here, Hideaki Anno weaponizes the neo-realism of animation to interact with ideas like this directly. Critic Roger Ebert touches on this unique power of animation, how it bypasses our perception and hooks directly into our sense of conceptuality, in his review of another anime classic, Grave of the Fireflies. I was trying to picture this as a live-action film because you would assume that a story of the firebombing of Kobe and the two, uh, the brother and sister who survive it and then who try to live in the aftermath uh, would be made for a live action treatment. You would never think of this as an anime subject. It'd be kind of bogged down in realism. Maybe it would be a very good film. I'm not saying it wouldn't be a good film, but it wouldn't be as pure or as abstract or as um, 
kind of crystallized as the anime approach allows. You would have real streets and real bombs and real people and real blood and real hunger and you'd have lots of shots of a little girl who was starving. And here you have a little girl who's starving but in a way what you have is the idea of a little girl who's starving. And then that's what moves you. If you had to see a real little actress of five or six years old um, baking mud um, pies or eating stones, um, the very fact of that image might get in the way of the meaning of that image. And so in a way, the fact that the story uh, is realistic and the artistic approach is stylistic works by not having two levels of realism clash against each other. Uh, it's almost like it's purer, it's more pure, that um, the stylized characters have this extremely unstylized and very harrowing uh, experience. In Evangelion, there isn't a single frame, let alone an episode, of dead air. Every second always plays a part in pushing the central characters forward to conclusion, even when seconds seem to stop. Evangelion is somewhat infamous for its use of ultra-long shots, at least four of them in the series running upwards of 40 seconds. That is an extended period of time, especially within a 23-minute episode, and it's one of the most unique aspects of the show. Hard to ignore given their glaring lack of cuts, these shots, like this one from episode 4, offer more than enough time to wonder what these characters might be thinking, and then what you might be thinking these characters are thinking and then realize you're thinking about what these characters are thinking. In this 43 second still shot, the show plays its first exercise in audience mindfulness, purposefully breaking immersion and causing us as viewers to pay attention, wonder what the show is saying, and then realize we've created a thought loop in wondering why we're wondering. Long static shots like this are nothing new to anime. In fact, it's a known trope, originating way back with the medium itself. In 1963, Osamu Tezuka, a revolutionary artist and creator of a small character named Mighty Adam, that's right, Astro Boy, turned his art house into animation studio Mushi. Unfortunately, Tezuka agreed on far too sparse a budget for his studio's first foray into serialized animation. In his novel Pure Invention, How Japan's Pop Culture Conquered the World, author Matt Alt recounts Tezuka's decision, stating, quote, Mighty Adam was a success proving the viability of domestically produced televised animation, but it also placed an arbitrarily low cap on budgets for decades to come, to the detriment of studios across Japan, his own included. The beloved hallmarks of Japanese animated fare, the striking of theatrical poses, the lingering freeze frames, the limited ranges of motion, evolved from desperate, cost-saving workarounds into the key factors that distinguish anime from the content produced in other lands. But they are more than stylistic flourishes. They are the direct result of that fateful choice Tezuka made so many decades ago. What others have used as a crutch, however, Evangelion uses as a club. Instead of a cost-cutting measure, although it's also that, Evangelion takes a traditionally low-budget technique and uses it to reinforce not only the realistic passage of time an emotionally stunted teenager would take to formulate their thoughts, but also make a meta point of it to the audience by causing them to realize really realize what's going on here. It's not just enough time to breathe, it's enough to think, to digest and process what's just occurred and what's about to occur. The longer the shot holds, the more the anticipation builds. There are double-edged edits like this scattered throughout the series, reused animation templates intoning a sense of perverse irony, or bathing shots in red until we associate the color with pain and isolation, or, possibly my favorite, arranging the frame in a way where characters move right to left to signal regression, weakness, fleeing, and the opposite, strength, positivity, and courage, when they finally turn around. Characters in this show say a lot they don't really mean. Either veiling their hearts or untangling their thoughts, how they present themselves to others, even to themselves, is often obscured by performance. But take a closer look at what we're shown what the series itself is telling us, and you realize, in a game of lies, the actions don't speak. They scream. That better be enough for you, because I got nothing else.
As much as I want to full dive into this show, there is not enough time in a single video to say it all. Several other motifs and brilliant editing tricks show up later, but I don't want to drag it out. I tried to keep this relegated to Evangelion's identity as a show, and what it says through that, I really, really did, but let's be real. It's a show about a lot of things, and I can never cover it all. Not here, anyway. So if you liked this, let me know. I've got another script already written, deep diving into Act 1 of the series, and notes for the rest of the show that I'd love to share. Discord members get early access to videos, extended cuts, and some behind the scenes goodies, so if you're interested in seeing that, feel free to join us. Uh, I'll be doing more film reviews soon, I know that you guys and gals liked the last one, so I'm covering the D&D movie releasing later this week, and the Super Mario movie coming out next month. In the meantime, I've been Jaro. you've been amazing, and I wish you only the best. God bless.